Thank you, Katja. Yes, my name is Regina Chikazola, and I am co-director of Save California Salmon. And I'm very excited today to start the first panel um, on bringing the salmon home. And this is so such an important panel. So I'm really excited to host it. And I'm going to start right away because we are slightly behind schedule, but that's fine. All right. So, and I'm I apologize about not being able to go live, but this will be available on YouTube. So um, feel free to share with anyone who was not able to get get on here. So I'm excited to introduce our first panelist, who I've been working with for decades now, um, and his name is Craig Tucker. Since 2004, Craig has coordinated the Karuk Tribes Dam Removal efforts. His work is part of organizing his part of public relations and part policy advocacy. His professional training includes a BS and PhD in biochemistry. After graduate school, he enrolled in the Green Corps to develop organizing and advocacy skills. And he has been such a great um, addition to our team that's trying to take down the Klamath River dams. And along while Craig is, after Craig is done talking, I just like to encourage everyone to do anything they can to help us in our efforts to take down the Klamath River Dance. Last Friday, we had a day of action um, and that is still available on Facebook and it's now, um, or the live part of it is still available on Facebook and it's also available on YouTube. And there's a lot that you can do to help us take down these dams. And hopefully Craig will give us an update on where we are in that process because it is, the fastest changing process I've ever been involved in, unfortunately, but we're going to do it. We're going to get them down. So thank you so much for having us here today or for being with us here today, Craig, and you have 20 minutes. Right on. And if I, I'm gonna, I can share a screen, right? If I, uh, to do this. Yes, you can share a screen. All right. So you guys can see the presentation there. Okay. So my name is Craig Tucker, as Regina said, and it's really been, um, Really, it's been an honor to uh, you know not be from here. You can probably you might be able to tell from my drawl. I am I'm not from a southern Karuk village. I'm from the I'm from the the southeast of the United States, and to enter in this community and participate in this work has been um, you know a big honor for me. And I would just kind of say as I get going in the presentation that I did have a lot of background in both hard science and a lot of background in grassroots organizing, but I really when I got started back in the early 2000s, I really did not understand um, the plight of Native people. I really didn't appreciate these environmental issues that I worked on as being the social justice issues that they are. And working closely with tribes these years has really taught me a lot and, and broadened how I think about all these issues. And I understand that these issues, none of these issues are really environmental issues. They're all social justice issues. But as we go through this presentation, I, I'll kind of touch on a lot of things where um, how TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, kind of informs our science, how the traditional way of thinking informs our activism. But it's been a big learning process for me over the years. Um, so I just kind of want to start out with that. Um, we talk about the Undamned Klamath campaign as being a tale of suit signs and scientists. And the reason I, I say that is this campaign has really been a full-figured political campaign. So, you know, we talk a lot about the, the activism and we do a lot of direct action and things that I think are, are flashy, but there's a lot of stuff that we don't talk about that much has been just as important. So we have, we have merged that public relations work and the, the grassroots action really happens in parallel with policy work, uh, lawyers filing lawsuits, and a lot of things that are more boring and behind the scenes, but you have to have the science, the policy, and the public relations to make big things happen politically. So I'll just kind of start with that. And I'll kind of just want to go through a quick history, uh, a 20 minute history of, the, of this whole campaign and kind of tell you where we are. But I just want to start by saying where the Klamath has been for decades, we call it sort of this rotating crisis. And so at the top of the Klamath Basin, there's this giant farm project that's fueled by a, um, a federal irrigation project. And so what's been going on for the last few decades, some years there's a water shutoff to either deal with endangered fish in the lake or endangered fish in the river. 
In other years, there's water shortages in the river and there's fish kills. And in other years, uh, because of low returns of salmon, ocean going salmon fishermen are not allowed to fish along the California coast to protect Klamath runs of fish. So we call this this, this kind of this rotating crisis. And there's a lot of reasons, uh, a lot of things that contribute to this crisis, but we're just gonna focus on dams. And the reason, there's a few reasons why we focus on dams. And one is, if I had to pick one, one thing that most affects salmon in the Klamath River and most affects water quality in the Klamath River, it'd probably be these dams. The other thing is that dams get a license to operate from the, a federal agency called FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And those licenses expire. And when they expire is your kind of magic moment in time to do something to change how the dam operates, or in our case, remove the dam. So the license to operate these climate dams expired in 2004, creating the opportunity of a big change. But we, we knew, and in, in America, there's been thousands of dam removals, but almost always, it's been the removal is the product of a negotiated agreement between the dam owner and the communities where they operate. So that was our strategy. We wanted to negotiate a dam removal agreement with the dam owner, Pacificor. And, but we had to kind of beat them to the table, right? We had to, we had to coerce them to the table. And when this battle started in the early 2000s, Pacificor, is a, it's, they're based in Portland. They work within six Western states. Pacifico was owned by a Scottish multinational energy company called Scottish Power. And so when we launched Bring the Salmon Home campaign, we loaded up about 30 of us and we went to Edinburgh, Scotland, and we crashed the shareholders meeting of Scottish Power. And that was kind of the, kind of the kickoff event, I guess, for, for the dam removal effort and we did that three years in a row. And amazingly, um, I thought that these little blue haired ladies that were shareholders of this company in Scotland were pretty outraged that the company they invested in were killing dams and putting Native American culture at risk. And um, I thought that there was gonna be a shareholder vote in Scotland that was gonna you know, lead to dam removal. But the management at Scottish Power instead sold the company. And they sold the company to Berkshire Hathaway Energy, which is owned by Berkshire Hathaway, which is owned by Warren Buffett, who is maybe the fifth or sixth wealthiest person alive. And, you know, it was really, for me, I was like, oh no, um, I think Buffett's probably gonna be a, a tougher opponent. But the communities around here were, were undaunted by it. And folks loaded up and went to Omaha, Nebraska and faced down one of the most powerful men on earth on his home turf in, a, in an arena full of 30,000 adoring fans where they had their shareholders meeting. And we, we crashed those shareholders meetings for several years. And so it was that kind of activism uh, coupled with um, you know, dumping toxic algae on Pacific Ores doorstep in different places in different cities, a uh, whole litany of lawsuits, uh, and then populating the FERC record with a lot of good scientific studies that explained in great detail how dams impact the Klamath River. So it was this coupled to um, the science and the advocacy work. And we did a lot of we did a lot of flashy stuff like this. And you know, part of the story and one reason that um, I think we're, we will win on the Klamath is these dams are really deadbeat dams. So they, they don't really make money for this company anymore. They're old, they don't make a lot of electricity. And in fact, getting a new license to operate the dams will require a lot of upgrades that really make relicensing costs more than the dams worth. It's like having a car that won't pass the emissions test. Do you wanna keep throwing money in that old car? Or do you wanna go buy your Tesla? Um, we're advocating for the Tesla, which is a cleaner, cleaner, clean, healthy Klamath River. But even though the economics favored us, um, the way the power industry operates and the way it can recover its losses through rates still made this a, a steep hill to climb. But we did a lot of outreach directly to Pacific Corps uh, power customers. 
and it was direct mail. You know, the previous image was an ad we ran on buses in Portland, but we really wanted the company to not only hear it from us and hear it from tribes, we wanted the, the company's own customers to be um, frustrated that their power bills may not only be more expensive, but effectively be subsidizing these dams or destroying the river. Um, I think I covered that piece. And then in the middle of all this, there's sort of this separate battle we, we were fighting, and that is over how much water is in the Klamath River. And the, although these dams are in the river and these dams hold water back, flows in the Klamath River are less a product of, dam, of these dams and more a product of how the irrigation project at the Klamath Headwaters function. So at the same time we're fighting this power company, the tribes are also fighting the United States in their operation of the Klamath Irrigation Project. And so we're kind of fighting a battle on two fronts, but Pacific Corps in some ways made it easy for us because um, just as difficult as Pacific Corps is for us to deal with, they're also were difficult for the farm community to deal with. And um, when these dams were originally built, the deal from the federal government was power company, you can build these dams, but you have to give these farmers on the federal irrigation project cheap electricity. And that cheap electricity lasted for a hundred years. But when the contract expired, Pacific Core did not want to renegotiate this, you know, cheap power deal with the power with the farmers. And so power rates started going up among the farmers. So the farmers were in a good position, or, or I'd say the farmers were motivated to uh, work with us uh, because we did not want to have to face opposition from the farm community with dam removal. Because the fact of the matter is the dams we're removing, the lower four dams in the Klamath River, do not provide any irrigation diversions. The irrigation diversions in the Klamath are further upstream around Upper Klamath Lake. So all this activism drove all the parties to the table. And um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> when he was governor of California, Ted Kulangoski, the governor of Oregon, uh, a whole bunch of state and federal agencies and tribes signed an agreement. Uh, and there were two agreements at this point. There was an agreement to remove the dams and there was an agreement to resolve a lot of outstanding water disputes uh, in the Klamath. And those two agreements to be implemented would require an act of Congress. So in 2010, we signed the agreements and then we started lobbying in DC. But that was also the year that kind of the Tea Party took hold in the United States Congress and we couldn't get our bill to pass. And there's a few reasons for it. I think we got caught up in, um, you know, there were a lot of members of Congress who didn't want to see anything happen while Barack Obama was president. So I think we got caught up in that, in the hyperpartisanship in DC. But we also had some Republican congressional mem Congress members from our region. And I'm talking about Greg Walden in Oregon. And I'm talking about Doug LaMalfa in California who were on key committees. And they didn't want to be any way, shape or form associated with a big dam removal. So they prevented our legislation from passing. And it looked like everything was going to fail because of this lack of congressional action. But at the end of the Obama administration, we plucked the dam removal agreement away from those others and remove the dams. And if that's all we we're gonna do is remove dams, we didn't really need an act of Congress. We just needed the permission of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So Pacific Core, the tribes, California and Oregon kind of reformulated the deal to be just about the dams and go through the FERC process. And everything was looked like it was clean sailing for a dam removal in 2020 when earlier this year, FERC kind of um, threw us curveball. The, the agreement had always been Pacific Core was willing to give us the dams and actually give us $200 million to take them off their hands. But Pacific Core was gonna be able to wash its hands of the Klamath and uh, wash its hands of any liabilities associated with dam removal. But FERC said no. Um, you can't just give the, we, so and we created a nonprofit, the Klamath River Renewal Corporation to receive the dams from Pacific Core and manage their removal. 
Ferg said, no, um, what if this new entity you created can't pull off the dam removal? What if there's cost overruns? What if there's problems? We want Pacific Core to be involved. So as of July of this year, it looked like after all these years and all this hard work, um, the deal might fall through. Uh, so we've been hard at work negotiating. And I think what I can tell you, and, and then I think the, the direct action and the pressure on the company, you know, the first time we did this, it, it was really difficult to get the company to the table. But because we had built this network of activists and because we had done a lot of work getting the public engaged in this issue, um, this time around, starting in July, the activism kind of kicked back in. And we had a big event last week. It was a, you know, this day of action. Uh, activists launched protests in I think, six different cities. And there's a ton of online organizing that was very effective. Uh, we had a full page ad in the USA Today um, calling out Warren Buffett for not following through in his commitments to tribes. And the result of that is the company re-engaged and we're not, we weren't talking to Pacific Corps anymore. We were talking to Warren Buffett's right-hand man, the, uh, the vice president of Berkshire Hathaway. And so where things stand, I can, I'm pleased to tell you all that um, I actually was on a call yesterday with tribal leadership uh, from Karuk and Yurok and the governor of California. And so I, I think what you'll find is in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be able to announce that we're moving forward and we're going to have a strategy to allow Pacific Corps to do what they want, which is to leave the Klamath Basin. And we will kind of pick up where we left off uh, in July and execute dam removal. And the state of California and the state of Oregon, I think, are going to step up and play a bigger role. And so that's where things stand today. And I think I. I think I want to pause there. Uh, I think I'd make a couple of points. Um, one is that we couldn't have done this without um, thousands of activists being involved. It just wouldn't have happened. Uh, the other thing is, I think this would have been a difficult campaign for environmental groups and NGOs to run in the absence of the leadership of tribes. Um, tri I think the fact that um, Karuk, Yurok, the Klamath tribes up in Oregon, the Hoopa tribe, the fact that the tribes, tribal leadership and tribal members have led this effort has really been the difference in um, success and failure. Uh, I, I just don't think it, if this had just been a straight up environmental fight and not a fight about equity and justice, we never would have gotten here. So I, I think, you know, the whole plan of the story, I do think is a model for how different campaigns around the country and around the world can tackle these kinds of complex problems. So I think I'll pause there, make sure all the other speakers have plenty of time to share their piece of the story and I'll stick around as long as you guys want and answer questions. How's that? Awesome, Craig, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to save questions for the end of the entire panel, um, and we'll try, we might not have time for a whole lot of questions, but that's okay. Um, thank you so much, Craig. It's such important work and it's such an important update and it leads into our next panel, um, which is Charlie Reed. So um, Charlie Reed is going to be presenting on spring Chinook salmon, which are the fish that would be the, mo the most helped by the dams being removed. And there's been a lot of new discoveries about spring Chinook salmon. So we're really excited to have him here today. Um, Charlie Reed is Hoopa Yurok and Karuk person. He's a graduate student in the ENC program at Humboldt State University, while also a youth advocate at Two Feathers Native American Family Services. Last but not least, he has also just recently become a first time father and um, Charlie Reed is someone I've known for a really long time and I'm really happy to have him here today. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you all for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be in these spaces, you know, having um, a lot of different colleagues throughout my entire life, but also like kind of in my academic life as well. Um, so I'm excited. It almost feels like a thesis defense with everyone in my committee here, but uh, I think it's good practice and I'm always down to kind of um, put our story out there as uh, Indigenous people and 
Uh, so yeah, let me share my screen here and we can get on the road. Mm. I'm assuming everyone could see that, yeah? Can I get a confirmation? I don't wanna. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we can see it. Cool, Alrighty. So yeah, um, the thesis work that I'm doing here at Humboldt State um, revolves around spring chinook salmon, like Regina had mentioned. And it's really, I'm really coming from the indigenous knowledge perspective because I feel like a lot of what I have to add to these conversations is coming from, you know, that personal experience and just the passing down of knowledge from my ancestors, from my elders and from my community. And so I, I found that that was kind of my niche in academia in itself. And so when I was um, put in a position to kind of support an already existing movement that I've been a part of since I was just a youngin. So I think that everything about me being in this space is meant to be, and I think this is my purpose. And one of my inherent responsibilities is to advocate for the protection of spring chinook salmon in the Klamath Trinity watershed from an indigenous knowledge perspective. So I think that's, and um, some of what I'll be talking about today is kind of like who I am, like I just had started to, and like kind of the background and rationale of my work. So like I'm gonna include like the environmental component of like why it's important to um, advocate for the spring chinook salmon, kind of like the policy kind of um, systematic racism form of this type of work and the sociocultural cultural purpose and, um, significance of the spring chinook salmon and the watershed in general and that'll kind of come into my, my research questions and like the methods that I plan on um, using for that and also kind of like since this is like an ongoing like I'm in my master's program right now I'm very much like having anticipation results so I'll be talking about like where I'm at with that and that's basically what will be what can be expected from this um, PowerPoint. And I'm happy to field questions. And I'm also um, looking forward to talking to folks like Julian because his stories this morning were just perfect. And then Craig's kind of um, advocacy from the, the law, the lawyer standpoint is exactly what kind of embodies the purpose of my um, research is just, that just puts together a really compelling and effective uh, narrative. So yeah, like I'm saying, um, Hupa Karuk Yurok person, um, coming from my mom's side, I'm Hupa Yurok. And so that's like most of where my um, indigeneity comes from. But growing up in Karameen, um, center of the Karuk people's world, I was taught nothing but a uh, Karuk kind of way of life. So a lot of my perspective comes from that Karuk indigenous science perspective and um, and something that I've kind of come across is that we have inherent responsibilities, you know, and I've learned that from um, storytelling, I've learned that from, you know, passing down of knowledge and um, just kind of day to day life principles is like, you must be a good ancestor, you got to be a good re relative and, you know, so throughout my life, I've had kind of going back and forth with the, what that means. And to be honest, I didn't always know what that meant. But you know, the more I get older, the more that I kind of grow into my own, I'm realizing that it stems from more than just being a fisherman, it stems from being more than just like a Pikiawish world renewal participant. And so, and I think very much of what I'm doing here in the academia world is a part of my inherent responsibility to bridge the gaps and knowledges of existing bodies of knowledge. So that way we create an effective approach and story to ultimately bring, up, bring the dams down and to bring our salmon home, you know, I think there's a lot of people north of uh, the dams on the Klamath who haven't had fish in the last hundred plus years. And that just hurts my heart because right now I'm getting a little taste of that. Just, you know, haven't caught more than 10 fish this year at our fishery site is devastating, you know? And so I'll be talking about how that impacts us um, on a social cultural level later in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Oh, shoot. Yeah. They didn't have my pictures up. Yeah. So this is a good map here, kind of talking about like the Hoopa Yurok people, Tawa north of us. And we are here, like, you know, where I'm at right now is in McKinleyville. So I think that's this is a really good map for me in particular. And this is a picture that I got from um, Kari Norgard, who's um, a foundational scholar and advocate for my work. A lot of 
where I, a lot of the data and stuff that I'm kind of articulating to support my thesis comes from her work. So I really am um, grateful to have her in my personal life, but also in my professional life. And this is a picture of just uh, my dad fishing down at the falls. This was back in the day, you can tell just by the, the level of the water here, this fishing hole actually, we haven't fished in that in quite some time just because of the lack of water. So I guess pictures can honestly tell their own story as well. And that's me as a little fella. So I always like um, having bits and pieces of the past and also the future. <clears throat> so yeah, the background and rationale of my thesis, one of them is the environmental component. You know, there's historically there's hundreds of thousands of fish that come during the springtime. And since we all know, you know, those climate dams cut, cut off about 90% of their spawning habitat impacts the water flows and quality of water. And there's so many different sources of literature that support that idea. And also, you know, just thinking about the out of the um, watershed kind of, not out, but upslope kind of species that also depend on um, the salmon, you know, just as the picture shows here, you imagine a bear catching a fish or getting lucky and catching a fish and bringing it up slope. And then you got, you know, carbon added to the soil. You got other birds and ants and insects and stuff like that able to feast on what's left. And so, so on and so forth, you know, that bear goes and takes a, you know, takes a poop. And then, you know, that just kind of goes into the life cycle that can ultimately create life that might not happen otherwise. So it's that silical kind of relationship that I think a lot of indigenous people believe in wholeheartedly. So. That's just one, those are a lot, of, those are just a couple of different environmental issues that come from the absence of spring Chinook salmon. And so the policy issues, this is where it gets really interesting um, and shout out Craig for kind of really putting this, like getting this in my head as far as like where, where the system kind of plays a role in, you know, the, in the um, protection or even advocation of spring Chinook salmon in particular you know, the Endangered Species Act was created in 1973 and is, you know, designed to protect um, species such as the Spring Chinook salmon who are, you know, like declining their um, historical norms as far as population and habitat. But for some reason, you know, since the establishment of evolutionary significant units in 1991, um, you know, kind of by design or maybe just slipped through the cracks that spring shook salmon do not meet that criteria because there's not enough proof that demonstrates like the genetic difference. And so there's a lot of, there's been a lot of efforts that have been denied in the recent and late years. And so that's kind of where I was like, yeah, this might help, you know, maybe this is what the, you know, the last straw that can kind of break, break that back. So I'm hopeful that this will contribute to the already existing um, forms of contribution. And so I think that is a we're gonna we have a pretty good case for that and um, and I think with the recent work of Mike Miller, Tasha Thompson, other folks who are in the genetics world from UC Davis, I think have come through with some compelling um, evidence that supports the idea that there is in fact a genetic difference. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in the what we know segment. So now we're gonna move on to the social cultural kind of issues that come from this. And like I said, a lot of the, a lot of this, these ideas come from Norgard's kind of lifelong work with my dad and other local, um, local tribal members and leadership teams who there's a long list like Craig has mentioned, and it wouldn't be possible without that long list of folks. And the thing that I really appreciate about Norgard's work is how she centers those voices and states her positionality. So then that, you know, there's that transparency, which honestly gains a lot of trust and, um, and loyalty. You know, I think those are components that really make for a healthy relationship when we're advocating for indigenous people if you're outside of the community. And so I think that's something Craig and others have accomplished really well too. And so that's why, you know, they're definitely um, family members of the community. So yeah, um, kind of back to the cultural issues, uh, tribal communities have symbiotic relationship with the salmon. It is believed that once the salmon and the river kind of start getting sick, we get sick. And I think Norgard's studies show that here in this graph where the soon as the spring Chinook population declines, diabetes rate comes up because then you become dependent on 
what what elders will call white man's food and there's just so much unhealthy um breakdowns of that diet and also like just the you know the sense of responsibility that you lose just by not having to provide for your family like getting out in the land getting your acorns getting your fish getting your berries you know like a lot of the different systematic racism that exists impacts the social health very um, explicitly um so yeah that's kind of the second point here and the thing, you know, for me, I could personally speak to this, just, you know, it's not just a fishery, it's a social area, like where this is where a lot of people would gather and just hang out and visit and transfer knowledge, you know, share stories of people's um, loved ones. And just like, an, it's very much like a, a gathering, you know, some fun times, some fun conversations. Like sometimes when I leave the falls, it's like my face is like cramped from smiling and laughing so hard. And that's even in times of not catching much fish. So, you know, there's that, that sense of, um, belonging still even in hard times and and you know ultimately with the the social issues of you know kind of our our scenarios of you know not having a re, uh, a treaty that grants us like permission to have land management practices or to be in control of our fisheries management things that we are very capable of we have an immense amount of knowledge that will support you know even now i think a lot of um agencies are now coming to the tribal communities asking for like assistance and you know some keys or key points you know just looking for that assistance and I think that's really great and I also think that it's time for us to start leading those processes so it's a part of what I'm trying to say in my research as well and so yeah leading to my questions let me minimize this here how can indigenous knowledge support the debate that is that there is a difference in spring and fall Chinook fall around Chinook what roles does the Kudik tribe have in watershed management decisions? How can Kudik people's way of knowing inform restoration efforts? So those are like three questions that I plan on asking uh, um, tribal elders, you know, tribal community members, as well as um, federal agencies such as Forest Service, fishery biologist folks, um, cow fishing game, you know, just different agencies like that. So then we get that like kind of holistic approach as far as like way of knowing, you know, definitely don't want it to be a bias. So just interview the elders as much as I think we'll come to a pretty great conclusion in that. I just want to be aware of how important it is to have that, to bridge those knowledges and kind of come together that this issue is very, um, it's everyone's issue. It shouldn't just be held on, you know, the indigenous peoples who are just basically victims of um, colonial genocide. So I think that's an important part of my research as well is just making sure all voices are at the table because I think that demonstrates uh, camaraderie and stuff like that. So I think that's important. And so, yeah, the methods, you know, this is very rough, uh, 15 to 20 participants community-based participatory action research, semi-structured interviews. And today, you know, considering the circumstances we're all in, um, it's hard for me because I don't ever want to have a conversation with community members over Zoom and over the phone because there's so much missed just in this location of where we can be. If we're out on the river, I think we're going to have some pretty incredible results rather than, you know, being in my office where I get a little bit of anxious, get a little bit of anxiety just being sitting cooped up. So, you know, I'm definitely trying to move forward with that the best I can. Um, so we'll see how that pans out for me. Right now, I'm re really focusing on um, the secondary source out analysis, just kind of getting asset access to archival data research. You know, I have my kind of dictionary right here, um, you know, with a whole bunch of stories and a whole bunch of words that I'm trying to learn, you know, and I think um, Julian being here today just reminds me that I need to get in contact and be in a lot deeper, more connected communication with him and others who have a lot of knowledge that could really help me in my project and ultimately um, our spring chinook salmon who are hurting right now and uh, missing out on a lot. And so I think that's also felt with each one of us too. And so what we know now is um, what I know now. And, you know, like I said, Julian, being here today could probably give me some pointers. Uh, language analysis that from my research in uh, the dictionary here, I've noticed, and this is also something that I've experienced just being the world renewal um, participant at ENOM up there at Clear Creek. 
one of the prayer sites is actually called Cheapish Rock, which means the small size Chinook salmon where they rest right under there, like right below the prayer site next to the river. And so that's interesting that, you know, the language kind of tells you that it's um, a spring Chinook small. And then, you know, you got a site that is sacred that also tells you like, yep, that's in fact, that me meets, you know, that makes sense. And ama is kind of like a general word used for fish. And what I found interesting in, you know, kind of my personal research is that, and this could be changed. I think this was a lot older edition where this um, definition come from, the ama term used before ceremonies begin. So I thought that was interesting. I definitely need to get that confirmation to make it certain. And, you know, the linguistic breakdown of ishia, ishia means winter and ah means salmon, so winter salmon. So, you know, there's some distinction there with the language that kind of alludes to, if not definitely states that there's in fact a difference between um, spring and fall Chinook. Not to mention, you know, the, the, just the visibility, you know, the different color of meat, the different, the different type of taste that I think a lot of my interviewees could vouch for. And another interesting thing that I've heard um, time and time again is that back when there's an abundance of spring Chinook salmon returning, whenever someone caught that first um, spring Chinook salmon, there, there's a ceremony for it, excuse me, which ultimately indicated that this is the start of our world renewal ceremonies. So I think, I, I think that's pretty um, important, you know, I think that if we lose the the return of spring chinook salmon, that's a form of cultural genocide because of this, because suddenly this tradition that we once depended on to indicate different timings of events for our ceremonies needs to still be kind of cultivated and revitalized and practiced. So I think if they, you know, obviously the other issues that will come with their demise, this is very much one of them. And I, I tag this as cultural genocide full and full and so that's something that I've kind of come up with just in my um, preliminary research um, efforts. On the other hand, Western Science and Mike Miller, Tasha Thompson, uh, Prince et al. 2018, they're all included in this kind of um, groundbreaking research where they find that the Greb 1L locust region identifies a migration gene which it should be enough um, differentiation that grants and constitutes uh, classification in, uh, in the Endangered Species Act. So I think with, with that in itself, it should be enough. But I think also when we name that the other forms of cultural genocide support that idea, they should kind of formulate that, that well-rounded um, argument that we need that protection. And, and that comes with the dam removal, right? Like if you don't remove those dams, the protection of you know harvesting or if there's any type of regulations that kind of protect them, it doesn't matter if 90% of their um, spawning habitat is inaccessible. And like I mentioned earlier, the social impacts, access to traditional diet is healthy communities. So without that diet, we start to diminish and become people that we weren't designed to be and that can't happen and it won't happen. So, uh, and so the anticipated results, um, credit people have the knowledge necessary to support the differentiation of the spring and fall Chinook salmon. Uh, and we also have the ability and knowledge to lead management processes. And our place-based place religion is foundation to restore, protect and govern watershed. And there's a lot of different tribal laws that we know today that speak to why we can why we have the knowledge and ability to properly restore and protect um, spring chinook salmon and you know implementations and like kind of revitalizations of things of like a weir where we're able to you know get get young men get a lot of strong people out there you know building you know practicing an activity that our people our ancestors have practiced and you know so there's that connection to to culture, connection to community, connection to place, you know, and personally you get your sense of responsibility, like, yeah, I'll come here every every spring if this means that we're starting to like kind of document when fish are arriving, how many, like start kind of regaining that agency of collecting our own data. And I know that, you know, Department of Natural Resources does a really great job. And I think that we could piggyback off of their efforts and their infrastructure in place to really make this feasible, you know. And, 
as much as I'm a dreamer, I like to think practically too. Um, so yeah, I think that might be it. And um, so, like I said, after any, after this panel, you know, open for questions, comments and concerns. And thank you all for um, listening to me today. Thank you for being here, Charlie. That's really a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate it. I'm not sure if people know this, but um, I think the Klamath might be the only watershed in California and Oregon where spring Chinook salmon are not considered a, a separate species. And we're down to several hundred some years of wild spring Chinook. So, I mean, this is a, this research is so necessary. It's an immediate need to save these species so that there are different species of salmon for people to depend on. Because right now, fall Chinook is the only harvestable species of salmon left in the Klamath River. So thank you so much for being here. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen, that would be helpful so the next person can. Um, and we will have question and answers, but not until the end. So thank you so much for being here. And um, the next person that I am really happy to introduce is Darcy Evans. Darcy is a PhD candidate in anthropology at UC Santa Cruz. She is a member of the Quartz Valley Indian Reservation and has been working with Save California Salmon for the last five months or so. And um, I'll let you introduce your subject matter and um, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, it's really great to be here and see some familiar faces. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you all. Um, see if that worked. Can you all see my PowerPoint? We can see your screen. Yes, now we can see it. Okay. So I'm gonna be talking about um, salmon aquaculture. Um, and so this is based on my PhD research in Washington State and British Columbia. Um, but I think it's important to keep um, like the Klamath dams in mind when I'm talking about these when I'm talking about this, because there are a lot of overlaps between kind of the issues that arise, kind of the structural issues behind these things. Um, and so I really got my start in caring about salmon and salmon advocacy through being on the Klamath and through seeing the damage that the dams cause. Um, and that's kind of followed me throughout my life ever since. Um, so that kind of led to this research. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few of the ecological issues that arise around salmon farming in the region. Then I'll talk about the indigenous led movement to remove salmon farms and how the practice of farming salmon is really enrolled with these within these broader structures of colonialism. Um, so here you can see a rough map of where I'm talking about. And this area is um, a really important salmon migration route for salmon that spawn in the Fraser River. And the Fraser River is known as the largest salmon producing river in the world. Um, so salmon farming here raises um, mostly Atlantic salmon in these open net pens where they're held for 12 to 18 months. And I think it's worth mentioning that there are really only three companies that operate salmon farms in BC, and they're all multinational corporations based in Norway, because um, Norway is kind of where salmon farming originated. Um, and so there are obvious concerns that arise around farming Atlantic salmon in the Pacific Ocean. And this is one of the only places in the world where Atlantic and Pacific salmon come into such close encounters. Um, so there are around 100 farms on the BC coast, and if fully stocked, they could each hold around 1 million fish. Um, and they're not usually fully stocked, and they're not all stocked at the same time. But in comparison, to get a sense of the scale of that, um, this year less than 200,000 sockeye returned through this area and migrated back to the Fraser River. And I actually think it was way below that. That was just an estimation of how many fish would return. And I think it was much, much less. Um, so there are many ecological problems that stem from this kind of new industrial turn in food production. Um, there are algal blooms, there are dead zones underneath the farms, um, the use of pesticides, there's antibiotic resistant bacteria, there's issues with how the fish food is created. Um, but what I'm gonna focus on here is um, parasites and pathogens. Um, 
So these are sea lice. Um, they're a parasite that penetrates the salmon's skin and feeds on their blood, which makes them weaker. It impedes their growth and strength and makes them more susceptible to disease. Um, so in the densely stocked pens, that enables sea lice to reproduce at extremely high rates. Um, sometimes they're called, it's, they're, they are reproduced at exponential rates. Um, and then the lice find new hosts on Pacific salmon when they migrate through the area. And this is especially dangerous for juvenile salmon. Um, the legal limit right now in BC is three lice per fish. Any more than that is recognized as being able to impede the salmon's survival. Um, however, as you can see from these pictures, juvenile salmon who have to migrate past the farms often have way more than three lice. Sometimes there have been up to 50 lice on a single fish. Um, and in uh, this summer, in some places, 99% um, of migrating uh, sockeye were found to have lice and 50% had levels of lice known to reduce survival. And now sea lice levels are considered to be at a never before seen rate in areas around the farms. Um, so that's just a really brief introduction to that issue. And what I'm gonna talk about next is viruses. Um, and viruses are a bit more complicated because unlike these lice, you can't really see viruses and they're harder to diagnose and harder to manage. Um, so studies of industrial animal agriculture have long warned us that the methods used to raise animals on such large scales contribute to emergent forms of disease. Um, so in my dissertation, I focus on Piscine ortho virus or PRV, um, partially because it's become such a contentious subject and no one can seem to agree on whether or not PRV should be considered a problem. Um, so the industry admits about 80% of their salmon have PRV, and some other studies have found that this might be more like 100% of their salmon that have PRV. So obviously with it being so widespread, it's become a huge cause for concern. Um, and PRV was only discovered or characterized in 2010, so there are still a lot of unknowns about it, um, but fish catch PRV through contact with other virus carrying fish or by coming into waters where the virus was recently present. And in the farms, PRV spreads really quickly and it's continuously shed from the salmon's body once it's contracted. And then once it's within the water column, it can survive for several days and its movements are amplified by the ocean currents that flow through the nets. Um, and in some cases, it's been found to travel potentially up to 100 kilometers. Um, so several attempts at genomic sequencing have found the virus to be of Norwegian origin, in some cases clustered tightly with a PRV isolate from Iceland. And this was unsurprising to many of the scientists and activists I worked with, um, since eggs for the farms are, or at least were in the past, imported from Norway and Iceland. Um, and as one scientist told me, the history of spreading these viruses around the world through aquaculture is well-founded. When you bring a species, you bring more than just that species alone. You bring the parasites, the viruses, whole communities of life come along with them. Um, and so that European connection is really key in explaining why it has such different effects in Atlantic and Pacific salmon. So um, without getting too technical, um, in the farm salmon, PRV stays within the red blood cells and that's taken as a sign that they might have evolved with the virus. Um, in Pacific salmon, it grows very fast in the red blood cells and eventually causes the cells to burst. Um, and when your red blood cells burst, um, this obviously impacts all your bodily functions, makes it hard to breathe, you can't process oxygen. Um, so that eventually was found to lead to jaundice anemia disease and subsequent organ failure. Um, and so this research only emerged in 2018. Um, and that was the first time that a study really demonstrated that PRV might cause different diseases in Atlantic and Pacific salmon. And that was quite an unexpected result. 
Um, and so I think that really highlights the unpredictability of microbes when they circulate between species. Um, so usually when a dangerous virus like that is found on a farm, all the salmon have to be culled, fish coming from the hatchery have to be tested, um, and in some cases, international trade borders are closed, and it really disrupts the entire global salmon supply chain. Um, but one thing I talk about is that PRV has not generated that response, um, and at least in BC, it hasn't even really spurred efforts to monitor its range. Um, and that's kind of because there are powerful forces that don't want this to be studied. Um, people in Canada and the US told me that it's really hard to find scientists that are willing to test for PRV. It's hard to get access to the farm salmon in order to test them. And that could be because when the industry admits that 80% of their salmon are carrying a virus that makes the blood cells of endangered salmon explode, um, it really could be the linchpin that causes this whole industrial apparatus to become undone. Um, and so these pictures are talking about a different virus, but I think they show um, how the entire process of raising salmon relies on global trade networks. And through these networks, um, pathogens really have the ability to spread worldwide. Um, and then when new viruses emerge and then are introduced to different ecologies all over the world, no one really knows what the effects of that will be. Um, just checking the chat, cool. Um, so my field work in the area um, corresponded with the Operation Virus Hunter campaign which was launched by First Nations leaders in collaboration with Sea Shepherd, which some of you might know from the show Whale Wars. Um, so the campaign travels to salmon farms. Um, they try to take water and salmon tissue samples and try to document the spread of viruses. Um, and sometimes hereditary chiefs and First Nations leaders will also board the farms to serve eviction notices and gather video footage of the fish within the pens. Um, so these are kind of some of the images that they see. Um, you can see like the fish on the top left has really swollen gills. They're kind of misshapen and have huge lesions. Um, and then sometimes the nets are really, really crowded. Um, and the comparison is made these days all the time when you think of COVID, how easy it would be for a virus to spread in those kinds of crowded conditions. Um, so that fish on the bottom right has a really big tumor. Um, and the fish on the bottom left is actually a Pacific salmon that washed up. Um, but its gills are really, really pale. They're supposed to be um, like bright red. Um, and so those pale gills are a sign that it had some kind of disease. Um, and then I also had some videos to show because I think hearing people talk about it is just so much more impactful than me just describing it. Um, I had two videos for the sake of time. I'm just going to show one. So I'm going to hope that the technology cooperates here. Are you able to see uh, YouTube? Yes, we can see. Okay, I'm gonna skip this one and just go to this one. Oh, hold on one second. Forgot to share the sound. Um. Okay, is that loaded? I see it. Okay. Hereditary Chief George Quaxister Jr., you're in my territorial waters. I'm just asking you a question. What kind of fish you got in this pen here? There's no fish in there. No fish? 
No baby fish or anything in there? Tons of baby wild stock fish in there, you know. Horrible. Not good. 30 years. <laughs> 30 years of that, and I know it hurts. And there's a pen here full of our baby fish. I need the fisheries out here right away. I have noticed one of the pens here. I asked a farm fish worker what kind of fish they have in that pen. He said they got no fish in that pen. I can see there is tons of baby fish in that pen and they should not be in there. That's totally illegal. There you go, this pen here has nothing but tons of baby fish and the pen beside it with the big Atlantic fish in it are feeding on the, basically the same style of a uh, same whatever kind of a uh, baby fish these are which we'll figure out when we look at the pictures but that's why they're so jumping around over there they're feeding on these baby fish you see here what's up with that As far as I'm concerned, they're here illegally, they're trespassing because I coincidentally am the hereditary chief of these territorial waters. They have never contacted me or whatever about being in our territorial waters. Well, the fact of the matter is, I'll always be here putting up a fight to try to stop this dirty industry and I know our people up and down the coastal channels here will be doing the same thing. It's just a farce if the governments don't put their foot down and get this stuff out of our country. So that was just one video. There are tons of them you can watch on YouTube. Um, and that was George Kwok's sister, uh, hereditary chief of the Liquitar Nation. Um, and he taught me so much about um, the impact that these farms are having. Um, so is my PowerPoint loaded back up? I believe so. I can okay. see, uh, see it. Um, so I think that clip is a great segue into what I'm going to talk about next, which is that this is all premised on indigenous dispossession. And while governments continue to deliberate whether things like PRV are a problem, First Nations have really taken it into their own hands to say that this is unacceptable. Um, and in just one example of that, um, these unceded ancestral territories are transformed into so-called Canadian public waters, which then can be leased to aquaculture companies. Um, and this construction of ocean space as a public commons actually has a long colonial history and thinking of the ocean as communal, as empty, as not owned or governed. Um, that's really kind of what enabled European ships to sail around the world. And it disregards the fact that these seemingly public waters are invested with deeply historic and intergenerational systems of marine stewardship. And so when these waters are unseated, George and other First Nations leaders um, argue that the government doesn't have the authority to grant aquaculture tenures in the first place. And as you heard in the video, um, they're trespassing. And so the practice of farming salmon also becomes a question of who has the right to determine which kinds of activities happen in this area. And so when you think of the colonial histories across the coast, attempting to control fisheries, attempting to control food production and food security, and trying to make people reliant on capitalist systems of food production, that's always been a part of the colonial project and attempting to sever connections to homelands to make it so that indigenous peoples can't survive either physically, spiritually or economically from their historic practices. That's all part of the ongoing reality of colonialism and that's not just relegated to the past that continues today. So I really see that this as part of a broader system that seeks to extract all that it can from these living ecologies uh, while power and money is concentrated in the hands of a few. And it's about providing food for some people um, 
as one of these company websites boasts, they have a certain brand of salmon that is sold to fine dining restaurants, while the others have to deal with the repercussions of polluted, and in this case, contagious environments. Um, so to me, this is absolutely about indigenous sovereignty. It's about food sovereignty and environmental justice. And it's about the ability to live and subsist outside of these colonial capitalist systems. Um, so to me, fundamentally, the practice of aquaculture cannot account for the fact that salmon are en enrolled in relationships of reciprocity and responsibility. Salmon are generous beings, they're knowledge keepers, they're ancestors. And when these relationships are ruptured, and when industrial practices cause the blood cells of fish to explode, I really see aquaculture as a form of contemporary colonial violence. Um, and so in this way, I argue in my work that not only does the spread of PRV contribute to quite literal transformations within the salmon migration route, it also contributes to a more pervasive and systemic toxic geography of settler colonialism. So the promise of the blue revolution, um, salmon aquaculture is the fastest growing system of food production in the world, which is kind of crazy to think about. Farmed salmon are BC's largest agricultural export. And I think the key word there is export. And so this is often proposed as a sustainable solution to the global demand for salmon and seafood. Um, but the title of my talk was a critical engagement with salmon aquaculture. And I don't mean critical just in the sense of a critique. I mean it in a way that we have to think critically about these types of projects that are proposed as sustainable. Who is calling it sustainable? Who gets to make the decisions about what happens? Who benefits from this? Where do the profits go? Why did the system even have to emerge in the first place? And I think all these types of considerations are what we need to think about when these big companies propose these projects in our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darcy. And I want to thank everyone for keeping to their time today because we um, the first panel is very crowded. Um, and I also want to let people know that in the breakout sessions for the next panel, there will be um, a panel on stopping genetically modified salmon um, from entering the marketplace. And there'll be more talks on fish farming within that panel. Um, so with that, um, this is for our last speaker for this panel. I wanted to introduce very quickly um, Kara Simpson, who will be talking about fisheries within the Mad River Basin. And I do not have a bio for you, Kara, so I'm sorry for that. Mm -hmm. no um, but introduce yourself and let us know what you're speaking about today. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Can you all hear me okay? All right. Um, yes, we can. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so um, I do have a 20 minute presentation. Um, I'm gonna see if I can try to condense it. Um, you'll have to forgive me because I'm already condensing a 186 um, page thesis, master's thesis. So I'm, this is my first presentation since my defense. So I'm gonna do my best. I might be skipping through some slides just because I think um, there's probably a lot of questions. Uh, so much important information has been covered already. Um, so I'm gonna start my PowerPoint and then I will introduce myself. All right. Okay. So my name is Kara Simpson, and I am a graduate of Humboldt State University's Environment and Community Program. Uh, I graduated in 2019, and um, I do live and work on Wiat lands. Uh, so I would like to humbly acknowledge and express my gratitude to the Wiat specifically, uh, but also to all local indigenous peoples and communities for allowing me to be here. Um, so before I begin, I would like to acknowledge my position and my privilege as a white Western uh, academic non-native researcher, uh, because I am primarily of a white European settler lineage. I do also acknowledge that on my father's paternal side, we are descendants of Kiowa and Wichita peoples, and on his maternal side, we are uh, four and five generations removed from uh, my Comanche and Choctaw ancestors. 
So I've lived uh, here in on We Outlands uh, since 2006. Um, my day job is that I'm a massage therapist and body worker. Uh, so I kind of come to the issue of water from a healing side. Um, so as I kind of move into the the world of moving forward with my thesis research or uh, research rather. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to balance the uh, water healing, fish healing uh, with kind of the body work and uh, human body healing sides of things. So just to proceed uh, from there. So I'm gonna start my timer just to make sure I'll stay on time. Okay, so the title of today's presentation is the uh, name of my thesis. Um, as I said, I am going to skip a lot of information today. So uh, if you are interested in more information regarding the methodology uh, of my thesis or my approach to the research, uh, please feel free to check out uh, my thesis through the ENC website or through Humboldt State University's Digital Commons. All right. So today um, I'm going to briefly go over the background and introduction to the study, um, but today we'll mostly be focusing on the results of the research and specifically focusing on oral histories with local indigenous uh, knowledge holders. Uh, so during today's presentation, um, I will primarily be focusing on why indigenous knowledge, knowledges, technologies, and science is firmly rooted and sustained through community and familial fishing and eeling an aspect of fish camp culture are valuable for many reasons, including that they are the only long-term data available on the overlooked fish, uh, fish and overlooked river I will be examining. So this invaluable knowledge uh, and knowledge system reflects deeply intertwined relationships between people, fish wa and waters, which continues to be disregarded and underestimated as it does not fit into the prevailing settler colonial structure of resource management and commercial viability. Um, so I'm gonna try to build on some of what you all have uh, spoken about today. And uh, I, I really am looking forward to hopefully talking with some of you uh, soon. I know uh, I really appreciate uh, Craig, how you talked about uh, the hard sciences meeting grassroots efforts. And that's what I would really like to see with candlefish and eel on the Mad River. Um, so that's what I'm working with um, towards with the tribes. So candlefish and eel fisheries of the Mad River are significant for indigenous peoples of the region, but they remain data poor and underfunded, even though candlefish is listed as threatened under the Federal Endangered Species Act, and eel is recognized as a species of concern by US Fish and Wildlife Service. So interviews for this research uncovered important cultural connection connections to candlefish, eel, and the larger smelt species in the area through stories of fishing, gathering, eating, and sharing. Uh, a few interview participants witnessed candlefish runs on the Mad and Eel Rivers in the past, but not, not since the 1960s. According to the literature, it is unknown if Eulacan have any presence on the river or if they have spawned on the river at all since the 1980s. Respondents recounted robust eel populations historically, numbers that gradually dwindled starting in the 1970s and 80s. Despite continuous genocide against native people, native food sources, and native waters, the ongoing efforts to institutionally legitimize indigenous peoples of this region, my findings reflect an inextricably linked bond between people, fish, and water that continues to live on. With their native food, foods and resources largely controlled by the US governmental agencies, local tribes are persistent in their efforts to exercise their sovereignty by working to protect candlefish and eel. This research reveals how cultural connections to these species remain important and the need for non-native resource managers to expand research and restoration efforts to include the overlooked river and these fish species and to expand their consultation with local tribes and indigenous knowledge holders in order to do so. So um, I'll have you note that uh, throughout today's presentation, I will mostly be using the language that is, reflects the majority of my interviews. Uh, so most interview respondents use the words candlefish or eulicon. 
uh, to refer to the species, uh, as well as eel and Pacific lamprey to refer to uh, Pacific lamprey species. So you'll see that in some of the slides, I do have the Wiat names. So we have uh, Rumula Wi, which is bolded and italicized. So all Wiat words uh, will be uh, bolded and italicized as you see here. And we have Gudao uh, for Pacific lamprey. All right, so I'm just gonna briefly introduce the study here. Um, so I became involved with this research after Candlefish was identified as a priority by Blue Lake Rancheria tribal members and staff who contacted HSU to have dat data gathered on the species on the Mad River. So this project is an attempt to respond to that request. Eel was later added because they hold significance for local tribes and until recently, uh, they have similarly been overlooked by non-native researchers and resource management agencies. So there are major research, uh, research gaps here. Um, I did in the research and especially with the interviews, of course, that brought in the area and I'll get into that later, uh, but there is no long-term data on these two particular fish species on this river. And so this kind of comes back to uh, what Craig was talking about in terms of uh, hard science and bringing hard science together with uh, grassroots activism. So really the only long-term knowledge that we have about the species on the river is uh, indigenous knowledges that's been shared through fish culture um, through and just through uh, local indigenous networks. And so I really relied on that for my research and qualitative research uh, is the only research that could really be done at this point to piece together a big picture of when were the fish last there? How many are there if they're still there at all? Are people still fishing for them? And how, when, when were people fishing for them in the past? And so that's really what I'm gonna explore today is the findings from those questions. And uh, hopefully I kind of see this as an intermediary project because I would uh, what I'm pushing for is for more funding and more research uh, to the tribes and to agencies and to the researchers uh, who have been focusing on this issue and to bring more attention to the rivers in this region um, and, and beyond really. Okay, so uh, Basically, the Mad River, the Lower Mad River, lies within traditional Wiat lands. Uh, it is referred to as Baduat. And this area is home to three local tribes. So before I started my research, I did go through uh, HSU's IRB process, and uh, all, uh, all interviewees did sign an informed consent form. They were able to choose whether they wanted to be tape recorded or not. Um, some folks uh, chose to remain anonymous. Uh, so I did receive uh, council approval from all three tribes, including the Bear River Band of Runnerville Rancheria, the Blue Lake Rancheria, and the Wiat tribe. Try to move a little faster here. So you'll have to bear with me. Okay. So the sample um, today, I'm going to focus on the oral histories, uh, but my research did draw from four primary methods. So that included oral history interviews with tribal members and indigenous knowledge holders, semi structured interviews with key informants or experts in their respective fields, archival research, and doc document review as well as participant observation. So please note that I do observe the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which outlines Indigenous Peoples' right to self-determination. Article 33 states Indigenous Peoples have the right to determine their own identity or membership in accordance with their customs or traditions. So that you'll see when I use quotes or things like that throughout the study, as well as in my thesis, um, there's not a systematic way of referring to people. Um, I chose their way of uh, referring to themselves. And that also includes the key informants as well. So however they refer to themselves or their position was how, is how I refer to them. All right, so most of the people that I interviewed were raised on recognized Wiat lands and all were living on or near local tribal lands at the time of the interviews. 
Key informants were primarily selected and solicited based on their professional research job duties or affiliations as they pertain to the research topic at the time of or before the time of sampling. All right, so subsistence living in a broad geographical landscape. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, and it sounds like, let's see, so it sounds like Charlie, you were, you're focusing on Karuk lands and on the Klamath and Tr Trinity uh, watershed. And I don't know if you've found this and I would love to talk to you about this um, later on, but it, with academic research, I think one of the funny things, especially coming from a Western side is trying to condense people into one geographic little area. So I think that uh, the kind of colonial structure uh, of which I'm a part is always trying to fit people into boxes and focus on species. And so one of the things that was challenging, but I also uh, just, I love about the research that I had the opportunity to do is that with every oral history, I mean, it wasn't just about uh, Pacific lamprey and candlefish, it was about the larger landscape, the lar larger culture. You know, if we talked about one species, there were stories about all these other different species that would come back to salmon and different different waters and different, and, you know, collecting berries. And so um, what that comes down to is this central theme of uh, fish camps and fish networks, but also the fact that uh, culture is not, ex is not created and it does not exist in a vacuum. And so, the, the cultural knowledge really reflects a much broader understanding of a much broader landscape. You know, people have not been contained to river systems. And so I did define um, primary and secondary landscapes in terms of where were people born and raised, where did they have most of their knowledge. But of course, there would be rumor mills within this culture. People would be called, you know, living on the Eel River, people would go to the Mad River because they would hear that uh, the eel were running or the salmon were running. So um, just keeping that in mind as we move forward. All right, so um, let's see, subsistence living in a broad geographical landscape. And move forward. All right, so speaking of this fish camp and the, the fishing uh, networks, so drawing from oral history interviews, fish camps can be defined as a camping or gathering event centered around harvesting migrating fish when families and groups of indigenous community members primarily join together on a beach or along the banks of rivers to share in the responsibilities and enjoyment of fishing and or eeling, or eeling cleaning and preparing the fish, cooking and sharing and uh, packing the fish out. So this became one of the most talked about things in the interviews. This is where knowledge grew. This is where knowledge was shared. This is where indigenous technologies were passed down through generations of basket making, um, creating the A-net frames to catch surfish uh, on the beach. So this is proved to be such an important central part of the culture. And this is where the knowledge lies and is passed down regarding uh, eel and candlefish among other species. All right. So we're gonna get into Yulikan. Um, so just a little bit of background about Yulikan is the largest of the smelt species. Um, candlefish, candlefish are a small anadromous smelt endemic to the Northeastern Pacific Ocean. So what Yulikan and, uh, and eel have in common with uh, the Salmonids is that they are anadromous. So Yulikan, they come up into the estuaries and that's where they lay their eggs. Uh, well as the Pacific lamprey, they go much further inland. They've been seen to go as far as 150 miles. So uh, going back, going into the dams, which I know uh, almost all the participants talked about today, uh, dams are definitely a major barrier, as I'm sure most of us know, for Pacific lamprey, and that's definitely an issue on the Mad River. So anadromous fish uh, in general are important because they're seen as key indicator species of stream health. And so there's a lot of threads that are connected in this research, and one of them is that uh, candlefish and eel being important indicator species of stream health, 
they're kind of like a herring in the coal mine, you know, uh, same with salmon. If they're not coming back to the stream, what are the issues that are happening on the stream that are not allowing them to come back to their natal habitat? And so that's a real issue um, that we need to look at. So uh, typically the Yulikon spawn uh, between December and May, um, and they haven't been seen, as I said, on the Eel River since the 1960s by the participants that I spoke with. Um, and in terms of the literature, they haven't been seen uh, since the 1980s. All right, and so this is what I found. These are the key findings from my research. So in terms of firsthand knowledge, um, there were four people who personally witnessed uh, Yulikon runs on the Mad River. Um, these were all uh, mostly people who grew up on the Mad River and most of them had fished for them. Uh, almost all uh, participants had consumed candlefish at some point in their lives. And often it was from a different river system. So uh, Redwood Creek was really pointed uh, to as more of the river system that tend to have more of a regular run. And that is confirmed by the literature. All right, so going into stories of candlefish. So the consumption of candlefish and the relationship with it um, really does highlight some important technologies. Uh, as we know, the basket weaver culture in this area is so important and such advanced uh, indigenous technology. So the primary, primary form of collecting uh, Yulikon was using uh, dip netting primarily used with uh, willow branches and uh, dipping it in, collecting it out. And so I definitely a lot of the, the oral history participants recalled uh, memories fondly. They remembered their grandmothers catching the, the fish and drying them on sand. So they would put uh, dried, dried grass on top of the sand. And then folks remembered picking sand off when they would have to eat them whole. Um, a lot of folks didn't really like the taste of candlefish. They said that they were a bit too oily, too rich, um, but they definitely mostly remembered them in this area. And as well as that, there were two people that remembered seeing them on the Eel River as well. So the Mad River is listed as the southernmost spawning habitat for the southern distinct population for the species. And so that's really important. It makes it a critical habitat. Uh, but there are observations of the of eel on the eel river as well. All right, so the estimated timeline of Yulikon runs, as I said before, four respondents uh, remember seeing them in the 1960s. If you all know where the Hammond Bridge is, so that's where the 101 crosses over the Mad River at the upper end of the estuary. And so folks remembered that they would go down there and they said they, that you knew when they were there because the birds and the loons would just gather and the whole sides of the river would turn silver and that they would just, they would flow, they would be migrating in such huge numbers that the whole river would turn silver. Um, and so that's an important uh, point because they did travel in large numbers. People did rely on them. Um, there is some historical ecology research to back up the fact that uh, smelt species in general have been incredibly important as a food source for people in this uh, region for a long time. But the thing is, is that just because there aren't large, large numbers doesn't mean that they're not there. And so that's why part of my mission is to push for more funding, more research to see if they're there at all, and to regardless work on protecting their habitat so that they could potentially come back even if they aren't there. All right, so moving on to eel. So locally referred to as eels, uh, Pacific lamprey are jawless, parasitic, anadromous fish species distributed in streams, rivers, and coastal waters all along the Pacific West Coast from Baja, California to the Bering Sea in Alaska. Uh, so they've remained rel relatively unevolved over the last 450 million years. And they are hugely popular among uh, local folks as we know. And uh, they, the North Coast systems uh, are considered a hotbed for a di diversity of lamprey species and the epicenter of Pacific lampreys range. 
Okay, so uh, the Mad River proved to be a popular river uh, for this cultural practice and a place where oral history participants noticed both small and drastic changes in eel populations during their lifetimes. All respondents grew up uh, eating eel. Uh, so that was kind of in stark contrast when we talked about candlefish. A lot of times people would talk about uh, other smelt species and fishing for uh, surf, surf fish and things like that on the beach versus when we talked about Pacific lamprey, people would bring out their eel hooks. They were so proud and excited to talk about their eeling culture and past. Um, so 11 of the respondents have eeled. Uh, the two that haven't are women who say that women do not traditionally fish and eel in their culture. Uh, nine have eeled on the Mad River in the past. Uh, so eeling is the method for catching lamprey as they migrate into a river, up the river system to spawn. So all interviewees eeled using a hook. So a hook is a long handle with metal, uh, with metal attached to it. Eelers hook the eel and use the centrifugal force to bring the eels down. Uh, so what was interesting, and you can see here, um, so I had uh, some of the respondents draw pictures for me as they talked about the various eeling technologies and how they changed over the years. And uh, I know I need to be wrapping up here, I do apologize. Uh, but Jason Ramos uh, with Blue Lake Rancheria uh, drew me a picture of these different hooks you'll see in the upper right hand side. And uh, he, showed, he showed how the different uh, river systems and the different people use different styles.